church, but I just wanted to kind of set the tone, and then we're going to pray this morning and ask God's blessings upon our gathering this morning. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Amen? And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we learned this past Sunday that we need to learn to see with a spiritual vision. We don't regard anyone simply according to the flesh. We saw that we need to savor what God has done for us in Christ. And we saw the heart of the gospel in those middle verses. And then the third thing we saw is that we need to speak the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel, which is what we're going to be studying today and tomorrow and again next Saturday and then next Sunday, Lord willing, as well. Amen. And so what a wonderful passage to kind of set the tone for us. We want to see people with spiritual vision through the eyes of the Lord Jesus. We we need to savor, that is, delight in, taste and see what God has done for us in Christ. And then we need to speak that message of reconciliation, the message of the gospel. So let me invite us to pray, and uh, let me say this before I pray. Our plan today is um, to have a 45-minute session with Brother Ed. Then we're going to have a little 10-minute break or so where you can use the restroom and that kind of thing. Um, And then we'll come back and we'll have our second 45-minute session, and then we're done for the day. So we do have a break planned in the middle of the two teaching segments, all right? So let, let us pray this morning, if we may. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy. And Lord, we thank you that you have lavished it upon us according to your steadfast love, according to your abounding mercy. You have blessed us with grace and forgiveness. And and, and Father, I, I pray today in the name of Jesus that you would enable us to see with a spiritual vision. People are not black or white or rich, or poor, or educated, or uneducated, but ultimately they are saved or lost. Help us to see people with a spiritual vision. Help us to realize that those who've been transformed by your awesome grace are new creations in Christ. And Father, we pray that you would help each of us in this room this morning as Christians to savor, to delight in, to think through carefully, to weigh heavily, and then find joy and delight in what you have done, God, for us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would equip us. Well, we're not here early on a Saturday morning if we don't want to learn and be equipped. And so I pray that you would use your man, our brother, Brother Ed Lacey, this morning to equip us to be more effective in speaking the message of reconciliation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, today that you would help us to understand it better and to love it more passionately. So anoint our brother today. Speak to us through him. And God, help us to be attentive. Lord, help our minds focus. Help us, God, to soak in. Lord, the truth from your word that we will hear in the two sessions this morning. Father, I pray today, I pray, God, for our people group of the day, the Mawati people in Pakistan. Father, there are 937,000 of these people. Lord, they worship 
Allah in the religion of Islam there in Pakistan. And Lord, there are none in this people group that we know to be believers in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray for the penetration of this spiritual darkness by the rays of your glorious gospel. I pray, God, that you would get the gospel to people in the Mawati people group in Pakistan. I pray, God, that you would open blind eyes, that you would, Lord, take out hearts of stone and put in hearts of flesh. Lord, I pray that you would save families and villages of these in this people group, Lord, in in Pakistan. I pray, God, that you would send in Christian teachers and pastors to help them grow in the faith once they have been brought to the faith. And, Lord, again, we love you today. We praise you. I pray, God, that in this room you would put upon our hearts that one. Who's your one? Who's the one we need to reach first with the saving gospel of Jesus? Help us, equip us now through our dear brother, Ed Lacey. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Brother Lacey. Would you all do that this morning? Let's do that. Thank you. Amen. It is a joy to serve you in these two weekends, and I come among you in just that manner as your servant. Uh, Paul said to the church at Corinth, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. And that's how I come among you, to serve you the Word and serve you in any manner the Lord would allow me to. Would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians 2, as we just begin an introduction thinking about this vital subject that I'm calling Christ-centered evangelism, doing God's work, God's way for God's glory. And I believe with all my heart that if you'll come with a teachable heart, a humble heart, and you're willing to embrace and imply the truths of the Word of God, you're willing to jettison, repent of any tradition, technique, and tactic that you discover is not biblical, if you'll come with that heart attitude, I promise you the Spirit of God will do a mighty work in your life this week. Amen? We're going to be filling in blanks, you see, as we go along, as Brother Jay said, and uh, we'll have many Bible references. I'll quote them, give you the passage. You can check them out in your own time. If you have any questions, I have, I have firm confidence that the workbook will answer the vast majority of those questions as we move along. But if it doesn't, you write it down. I'd love to speak with you after the sessions. But without any further ado, let's look at this passage that we'll be parking on, at least begin to look at this morning, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This will be our doctrinal foundation that we'll spend quite a while on in, as it concerns doing God's work, God's way, for God's glory. Notice verse 12, the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says, Furthermore, when I went to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, 
But as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Now, before we even begin to get to this uh, passage, I'm going to spend quite a while in an introduction. I'm kind of going to be on the front porch for a little while before I walk in the front door, okay? Notice this question as we begin the workbook, number one, what is eternal life? If I walk through the average evangelical church on a Sunday morning and ask that question, what is eternal life, I'm certain I'd get some interesting answers. Some people would say, well, that's going to heaven when you die. But that's not Jesus' definition of eternal life. Uh, Some southern gospel singers would say, well, that's walking on streets of gold, looking at gates of pearl, having my mansion over the hilltop, and a reunion with Grandma. But that is not Jesus' explanation of eternal life. If anyone knows what eternal life is, the Lord Jesus should know. Amen? And he says, fill it in there, letter A, John 17, 3, in his great high priestly prayer, he's praying to the Father, and he says, this is eternal life, that they may know the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son, whom he has sent. Notice that eternal life is not found in a place. It's not found in a plan. Eternal life is not found in a formula. Eternal life is experienced and enjoyed by entering into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, eternal life not only speaks of an endless quantity of time, it describes a divine quality of life. It is the life of God in the soul of a man. This is eternal life, that you might enter into a saving knowledge and a vital union with God the Father, God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit, so that because of that vital union, let her be, Jesus might become the chief object of your devotion and the chief source of your delight. This is why God brings sinners into a saving knowledge and vital union with His Son so that the Lord Jesus might become the supreme love of our life above all other people and things. He might be the sovereign Lord of your life. He might be the very center of your universe of existence so that you might give your adoration to Him. You might give your allegiance to Him. Because of that, you might be known in this community as one who's a true disciple of the Lord, one who delights in the Lord, one who is devoted to the Lord, so that flowing out of, bubbling up out of the fountain of the saving knowledge of Jesus, notice letter C, the Lord Jesus might extend his life through you. He might express his character through you. He might exhibit his power through you. You. Oh, but Brother Ed, what is the ultimate purpose of this saving knowledge of Jesus, this living union with Jesus? Is it only to go to heaven when I die? Is it only to cash in on some fire insurance from hell? Is this the purpose, just to attend a church and have some nice moral relationships with other people? Is it only to fill our head with more intellectual information about the doctrines of the Bible and yet never exhibit any passion and purpose to be actively on mission with God? Oh, no. God brings sinners into a saving knowledge of His Son, letter D, that you might be on mission 
with God that you might cooperate with God's great mission in this city and in this world. And dear brothers and sisters, a theology that does not result in a desire and a determination to be on mission with God is not a biblical theology. In a church that has no passion and purpose to be actively on mission with God, it is not a New Testament church. And a professing believer, a professing disciple who has no yearning, no longing to be actively on mission with God should certainly examine themselves. Or something is desperately wrong. Friend, if you've been called by a mighty call of grace, you've been called to become a caller. If you follow Jesus, he will make you a fisher of men. God redeems sinners so that we might have a passion and purpose to fulfill the great commandment to love the Lord our God with 100% of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and flowing out of that to fulfill the great commission. And this great mission is not an option to be considered. It is a mandate to be obeyed. Amen? This is why we call it, Roman numeral 2, the great co-mission. For as the people of God, we are commanded to cooperate with God's great mission. Now I remind you, this is not my mission primarily. I did not authorize this mission. I did not ordain this mission. I didn't originate or initiate this mission. Primarily, this is whose mission? This is God's mission. I am cooperating with God's great mission in this world. And what is that great commission? Well, we know it. Probably all of us in this room have memorized it. You could quote it to me, but I give it to you there, letter A, just to remind you. Our Lord Jesus says after his resurrection, he said, Go, therefore, and get decisions. Is that what he said? That's what we've been doing for almost the last century. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, go and make what? Disciples. He commanded us to go and make disciples. And as we observe the instruction manual, we clearly see that God's ordained mission is a mandate to you and I to go and make disciples by being living witnesses unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, the God who has authored the mission, the God who has initiated, who has ordained the mission, has given us His ordained ordained means to carry out his great mission. And we clearly see them spelled out in the book of Acts, in the instruction manual. What are God's means to carry out God's mission? Well, first of all, it's you and I living a Christ-centered life in the midst of this self-centered culture. That's one of God's means. And one of God's means is you and I to be involved in passionate, persistent, evangelistic, intercessory prayer for those that God brings within the sphere of the influence of our lives. That's one of God's means. What are God's means? Well, they're you and I being willing to be involved in voluntary sacrifice and even suffering if necessary for the extension of the kingdom of Jesus into the hearts of sinners. That's one of God's means. 
and we'll cover this in detail as the two weekends progress. But then God's primary means is for you and I to take opportunities and make opportunities to proclaim, as we'll see later on in these weekends, a Jesus-focused message. And that also includes not only proclaiming Christ, but prosecuting the sinner. And then pleading with sinners, as Brother Jay has already read to us, urging sinners to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then prayerfully waiting for the Holy Spirit to accomplish what only God the Holy Spirit can accomplish in God's timing, and that is to transform a lost rebel into an authentic disciple of Jesus. Amen? In other words, we must do what all we are called to do, but we must not step across the line into God's territory with our own humanly concocted techniques and tactics. We must prayerfully wait for God to do what only God can do. And this is the great tragedy in, uh, since at least the 1930s in America, and not only America, because we've taken this all over the world. I was teaching in Hyderabad, India, just a few days ago, and those Indian pastors were repenting over techniques and tactics that they learned from Americans through the decades. Since the early part of the last century, there has been a slow and subtle drifting away from exclusively using God's means to carry out God's ordained mission and waiting for God to accomplish what only God can accomplish in God's timing. There's been a sinful, subtle drifting away from those means, and the vast majority of evangelical evangelism has been men, women, attempting to pressure sinners to make Make a decision in our timing instead of prayerfully waiting for God to do what only God can do in God's timing. And the great tragedy is when your primary goal is to get a decision in your timing, inevitably you're tempted to minimize the message to dilute the message. If you're not very careful, you'll be tempted to water down the message. And much of the evangelical church today has become guilty of inventing a message that does not, I'm talking about an evangelistic message, that does not primarily keep the spotlight on the person of Jesus, the prosecution of the sinner, the work of Jesus, and the gospel commands of Jesus. Instead, Instead, we're focusing the message on the felt needs of sinners. And we're, we become guilty of proclaiming man-centered messages, felt need-centered messages. Or we become guilty of diluting the gospel message by deleting any gospel truth that we may feel may be offensive to the sinner. And the focus of the message drifts away from where it should be. But friends, we're not witnessing unless we're keeping the spotlight of the message on who Jesus is and who the sinner is in his lost condition and what Jesus did and what are Jesus' gospel commands to enter into a saving knowledge of him. Listen, we must proclaim him. We preach not ourselves. But we proclaim Christ Jesus the Lord, and you're not witnessing 
if you're not proclaiming the bad news of the sinner's terrible problem before God and the good news of God's tremendous provision in Jesus and you're proclaiming the gospel terms. Friends, we have no right to change the message. We have absolutely no authority to move the focus of the message away from Jesus. Book of Acts witnesses never altered or diluted or diminished the message to accommodate the surrounding culture. And why has this happened? Well, because much of evangelicalism is interested in getting decisions in their timing. And when you're interested in decisions, you'll become guilty of minimizing the message. But not only that, if we're not careful, we'll become guilty of humanizing the means. Churches are inventing all manner of means, of methods, formulating all sorts of fleshly concocted techniques and tactics that are nothing but the inventions of men. They haven't been given to us by God in his word. They haven't been ordained by God. They're nothing but the inventions of the arm of the flesh. And we'll see this in detail as we move along. And why are preachers, seminaries, organizations, churches minimizing the message? Why are they humanizing the means? Because they're looking for numerical success in their timing. They're looking for immediate decisions in their timing. But the Lord never said a thing about going and getting decisions. He said, go and make what? Disciples. That is, letter B, the great commission. And we are summoned to cooperate with God's great mission. Now, remember, I'm just on the front porch. We haven't walked in the front door yet. We're just on the porch. Now, if this is the great commission, if we're commanded to go and make disciples, that brings me to letter C. What is a disciple? Allow me to give you some biblical uh, uh, descriptions or definitions of a genuine New Testament disciple. What is a disciple? Number one, a devoted learner or student, if you like, of Jesus as prophet. That's a disciple. One who is coming after the Lord Jesus as their master teacher. For the living word has come to live in this person by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when the living word comes to live in a man, a woman, even sometimes a young person, he gives them an insatiable appetite for the written word. Before I was converted at almost age 30, I had never opened this precious book in my life. I was a jazz fusion drummer at this point in New Orleans, Louisiana, and if you would have said the word Genesis, I would have immediately thought about Phil Collins, the drummer for Genesis. I didn't have a clue. But you know, when God birthed me from above, suddenly I got an insatiable appetite for a book I had never opened before. (laughs) To read it, to study it, to purpose to submit my life to the will of God as I was discovering it in the Word of God. That's a disciple. What is a disciple, number two? Oh, a miraculous work of the Spirit of God transforms this sinner so that they become, number two, a determined follower of Jesus as king. 
Not only are they coming after Jesus as their master teacher, they've come under Jesus to be their king, their master, their Lord, because this man, this woman, this young person has been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear son. And when I entered into the new kingdom, I came under the authority of a new king a new master, a new throne. At 30 years of age, I was delivered out of the kingdom where sin is the master and delivered into the kingdom where Jesus is the master. That's conversion. Conversion is not the end of slavery. Conversion is the exchange of masters. It is the implantation of the throne of Jesus in the heart of a person. That's a disciple. What is a disciple, number three? A dependent believer on Jesus as priest. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a disciple, one who is continually coming to Jesus as their great high priest. Because even though I'm following Jesus as my master teacher, even though I've come under Jesus to be my king, I don't follow perfectly, do I? We stumble. We struggle. But thank God that when we fall on the narrow road, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We have an intercessor who ever lives to make intercession for the saints. What are you saying, Brother Ed, on the front porch here? I'm saying that when a sinner is converted, Jesus becomes their prophet to teach them, their priest to atone, to mediate and intercede for them, and their king to guide and govern their life That's a disciple. And Jesus said, go and make what? Disciples. And that brings us to letter D. If we're going to make disciples, we must be willing to do God's work, God's way, for God's glory. If we're going to see genuine births from above and not more superficial, artificial religious experiences, but if we're going to see authentic followers of Jesus truly transform lives for the glory of God, then it is not enough for me to just run out into Sims and say, I'm going to do God's work any old way. For God has a way to carry out his work. God has given us ordained ordained means to carry out his mission. Now, let's continue on on the front porch. Notice, I'm just in introductory thoughts, Roman numeral three. We're thinking about this great mission. What is the Father's mission? What is he up to in Sims, Alabama, and on this entire planet? Well, letter A, the Father is giving a love gift to his Son. That's what God the Father is doing. Throughout the timeline of Scripture history, God the Father is assembling a love gift that he has given to his Son. Out of a race of rebel sinners who deserved nothing but the unmitigated wrath of God who should have all been condemned to eternity in hell. And yet the Father in amazing grace and marvelous mercy and astounding love is giving a love gift to his Son. We glory in John 3.16, don't we? God so loved the world. But have you ever thought about this truth? 
God the Father so loved God the Son that he gave him a love gift from every people, tribe, tongue, and nation. That's what God's up to in this world. Let her be, he is gathering in a bride for his son. We call it the bride of Christ, don't we? A beautiful metaphor for the redeemed church of God. The Bible says a number that no man can number who will be the Lamb's reward for his suffering, who will be his portion. And every part of that bride is going to become adopted into the family of God. They're going to be the accepted in the beloved. They will be Jesus purchased possession. Brothers and sisters, God is on mission in Sims. He's on mission in Mobile. He's on mission in this world. He's taking out of the world a people for his name. Let her see from every tribe, tongue, nation throughout the timeline of history. No wonder the Lord Jesus said in John 6, 37, write that reference down and watch me for a moment. This is why Jesus said, all, what percentage is all? 100%, okay. All that the Father has given me will come to me. And those who come to me, I will in no way cast them out. I'll tell you what, that's solid assurance, amen? I cannot be cast out, and it's not on the basis of my performance. It's on the basis that the Father has given me to his Son. And the Son would never cast out a gift that the Father's given to him. Amen? John 6, 39, write that down. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. This is the will of my Father who has sent me, that of all he has given to me, I should lose none of them, but raise them up on the last day. This is why the good shepherd said in John 10, 37, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eight-year life, 10-year life, no, eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Listen, why? My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. This is why the great high priest and his high priestly prayer prayed in John 17 too. Father, you have given me authority over all flesh. What percentage of flesh is all flesh? You've given me authority over all flesh for what purpose? So that I should give eternal life to as many as you have given me. Now, what's your point at this point, Brother Ed? Notice Roman numeral four. If you're redeemed, if you're sitting out here this morning, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you are part of that love gift. Have you ever thought of yourself like that? This former agnostic, arrogant, argumentative, near-alcoholic, rock and jazz fusion drummer is part of a gift that the Father has given to the Son. And if you're born again, you're part of that gift. Isn't that awesome? Uh, But for what purpose? To sit on your blessed assurance? To be a religious spectator? To live in this uh, this uh, carnal society and be completely involved in indifference and complacency and apathy and negligence as far as God's great mission is concerned? 
But to be continually distracted in your mind by lesser things, by temporary things that have no eternal value, no spiritual significance? Are you part of this love gift so you can just get in little huddles and make absolutely certain you have no contact with those filthy sinners around you? No. You're part of that love gift for a purpose, letter A, to be on mission with God. As he gathers in the rest of this love gift, to say from the depths of your heart, Lord, here am I. Send me. Lord, I'm ready to go anywhere, to anyone, at any time, at any cost, to be a fisher of man, to be fruitful in your great mission. And listen, brothers and sisters, the every born-again believer has been given the Holy Spirit in large part for the sake of being on mission with God. To be actively on mission with him. And notice what the Lord Jesus says to the original disciples and to every disciple in this room, letter B. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should sit. No. He appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Do you notice what the Lord Jesus is saying to authentic disciples? You've been selected out of this world for the purpose of being propelled back into this world to be on mission with me, to be witnesses unto me, to be gospelers, to be heralds of the bad news and the good news so that souls might be converted from rebels into disciples. And notice what the Lord says in John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. And that little phrase at the end of verse 8 actually says, so you prove to be one of my authentic disciples. This is Jesus speaking. He says, here's how my Father is glorified. Now, every born-again child of God wants to glorify God. Amen? And Jesus says, here's how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. This is how you prove you're one of my bona fide disciples. In Roman numeral 5, what is that fruit? Well, that brings me back to our passage. In light of the passage I read this morning, and we'll see this in detail in the next session, in light of the passage I read, that fruit is depicted as, it is portrayed as, in verse 14, in letter A, the fragrance of the life of Jesus Christ being made manifest in and through your lips and your life. As God brings people within the sphere of the influence of your life, they might be acutely aware of the aroma of the saving knowledge of Jesus in you and through you, through the life that you live, through the message that you proclaim. Now let's paint some pictures just for a moment of what I'm attempting to say. Letter B, that our lives might tell the truth about Jesus, that your life and my life and our lips might be telling the truth about Jesus to our neighbors, friends, workmates, acquaintances, those that God brings within the realm of our living, his sweet fragrance might be manifest through our lives. We could say it this way, let us see. 
our lives might bear a family resemblance to the Lord Jesus. In an ever-expanding, ever-enlarging manner, ever-growing family resemblance to the Lord because people need to see in you a Christ-centered life that is verifying and validating that Christ-centered message that you're seeking to proclaim. In other words, they need to hear the right message coming out of the right package. Letter D, I'm just painting some pictures of what I mean. Letter D, our lives might bear the birthmarks of the new birth. Your life might be evidencing the first John birthmarks that you have been born of God. People, as they observe your life, they truly see someone who is delighting in the Lord, who is devoted to the Lord, who is a true disciple of the Lord, because your life is displaying the first John evidences that you have been born of God. I'm painting pictures of what I'm saying, letter E. Our lives might bear the evidences that testify that we are on the next narrow road. I haven't entered the wide gate of counterfeit conversion. I'm not walking on the broad road of religious deception in danger of Jesus saying to me, depart from me, I never knew you. Oh no, I've entered the narrow gate of bona fide conversion. I'm walking on the narrow road of a saving knowledge and intimate union with Jesus. And the evidence is my life is bearing the road signs that clearly testify I'm on the right road headed to the right destination. If you've been born again, God has put a treasure in an earthen vessel, in a clay pot, so that that treasure might be dispensed through your lips and displayed through your life. Now, I'm moving on, letter F. We need to get to the end of the introduction here. Letter F, Jesus says, without me, you can do only a few things. Without me, you can do what? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And he's not speaking to unregenerate people when he taught that passage. Judas had already left. He's speaking to branches who are in union with the vine. And he says, listen, without my presence, without my power, you can do absolutely nothing of any eternal value, of any spiritual significance. But he also says in verse 5, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So we see that if your life's going to exhibit much spiritual production for the glory of God, it's going to flow out of this living reality of abiding in Jesus. So I want to know what does Jesus mean when he says to abide in him? Well, there's actually a twofold definition of that word. For in one sense, the word abide in him, it means to remain in him, to continue in him, to persevere in him, which is the evidence that a person is born from above. Amen? Uh, They continue. They persevere. Uh, They don't have a six-month faith or a one-year faith. Uh, They don't exhibit a temporary, shallow, superficial, artificial faith. They remain. They continue in Christ. But in another sense, that word abide pictures a born-again believer making their residence, making their abode in an intimate, personal, daily communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Letting your personal habitation 
to to abide in, to remain in the fire and freshness of first love intimacy with Jesus. The key to being a fruitful disciple is to continue to make our daily residence in intimate first love communion with him. To walk in a living connectivity to the Lord. And that brings me to letter G. What is the ultimate purpose for this abiding in Jesus? So that the fragrance of the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh within the sphere of the influence of our lives. And thus, bear much fruit. And thus, Bring glory to our Lord and Savior. And thus prove to be one of his authentic disciples. Well, that's the front porch. Let's take a 10-minute pause, and when we come back, we'll begin to dig into this text from 2 Corinthians chapter 2.